Hey friends, welcome back. I'm Christina, the manager of the Pacific Beach Library. Thank you for joining me for day 17 of our read along together of Emma by Jane Austen. And we are getting so close to the end. Oh, I love it when things come together. Um, let's see, and of course, I once again forgot to take out my tea bag. Let's do that, do, 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 do. tea preparation. Um, as we mentioned yesterday, or as I mentioned yesterday, um, I'm still trying to figure out the best way for us to do the film screenings. So we can have a chatting aspect. So I'm gonna experiment with that today and hopefully be able to post something tomorrow in our group about that. I am excited to be able to watch a film with you on March 13th. This will be our first time watching an adaptation together of one of our film or one of our books. So let's see how that goes. I hope well, I hope really well. All right, so today my tea is, it's a basic tea. It's a black tea with lemon flavoring. So it's just a lemon tea. Nice, nothing fancy, but sometimes you just want simple. Hey Judy, good to see you. Um, let's see, um, let's talk a bit about yesterday's reading. Yesterday we started volume three, which is the concluding volume of our book. And, um, hmm, let's see. It started out with Frank Churchill being, um, informing his father, Mr. Weston, that he was being going to be able to come back to the neighborhood. His mother was going to go, uh, sorry, his sort of adoptive mother, his aunt, Mrs. Churchill, was going to be going to London for a while. And then they changed her mind and she decided to go to Richmond instead, which apparently is even closer to where they live. So that's a good thing. And because Mr. Weston was, or sorry, Mr. Churchill was coming back to town, they decided to hold the ball again at the crown, or sorry, the dance, the ball, the party, whatever you want to call it. And so um, most of this so then the, the big the biggest chapter that we read yesterday was about the party at the crown. And so um, interestingly, Mrs. Elton, who has recently come to town and is the new bride of the vicar, Mr. Elton, she believes that the ball is being thrown in her honor because she is the, the you know, the newest resident and she's, you know, she's Mrs. Elton, of course, it's in her honor. And so um, she arranges or she sort of hints that, of course, she'll be the one leading the dance. And it's interesting too, because she's like, well, you know, of course the ball was thrown for me. And so she should lead in the party. And so they, what they end up doing is having Mr. Weston lead in Mrs. Elton. So they lead the first dance. And Emma just has this little moment of like, well, that's so funny. She would have thought it was for her. Cause really, I thought it was for me. <laughs> and you know, really was it for Emma or is it just what she thinks it is that they all think it's for them? Hmm, hard to say. Um, if you have thoughts on it, please comment. Um, there are some wonderful, wonderful long passages um, in that chapter two of Mrs. Elton. Talk, 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 talk. And then uh, Miss Bates come in. She's the aunt again of Miss Jane Fairfax. And she comes in and she's so excited and so grateful to be there and so, so, so everything. And so, yes, literally, I'm looking down at this. It's like a good page and a half of Miss Bates just talk, 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 talk. And it's just, there's a lot of dialogue in that chapter. It's a fun one. Um, I also would say too, I remember reading um, one of the contemporary reviews of Emma saying that it's some of the, re the editor, sorry, the reviewers at the time were saying they didn't quite like it because it seemed like a story where not much happens. That these people are just, you know, like even as Emma said herself, her brother-in-law, Mr. John Knightley had said that there'd been so much activity happening of late. And she's like, I went to one, dinner party where we danced twice and then we talked about having a dance and it didn't even happen and so it's like you know if, if you think about it in that sense there's not a lot of action in the story but there's you know just like the, it's this, this picture of quiet village life and how there's so much bubbling and happening and so many feelings engaged and things so even though there's not like it's not the action and adventure thing like of what we saw when we read Count of Monte Cristo together but there's still so much happening. I mean, it seems to be quiet, but like there's all these little blips of activity and um, people's emotions are all getting riled up along the way. And so it's it's interesting in that sense that we get to see them each thinking that it's all about them. Um, let's see, let's continue on. Um, the dance happens, there's a lot of dancing. Emma has a little moment where she is quite perturbed because she notices that Mr. and Mrs. Elton are taking pleasure in being mean to Harriet. And there is a scene in there where the men and the women are pretty much paired off enough so that they should be able to have consistent numbers of people dancing. But Harriet is left unattended for one of the dances and she's sitting on the sidelines. 
And the reason is because Mr. Elton, she, he, would, he would have been her partner in that dance, but he chose not to. And in fact, he makes a point of going to these other women like, oh, Mrs. Weston, would you like to dance? Oh, no, okay. Oh, Mrs. Goddard, would you like to dance? Oh, no, 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 okay. And then when somebody suggests he dance with Harriet, he's like, oh, no, I'm past dancing. I don't dance anymore. And so he was really being a jerk. I mean, he was... He was being really rude to Harriet. And at the same time, Emma says she observes that Mrs. Elton, his wife, is like making encouraging glances at him and encouraging him to be mean to Harriet. And it's it's really unfortunate because they had previously genuinely thought that he was a nice person, that a well-mannered person, a gentleman at heart. And the fact that he would be so petty and mean-spirited to Harriet is rather disturbing to see. Um, and Emma later on mentions too how she feels like she's misjudged him and that she's not as good a judge of character as she was. Um, what's nice about that resolution though, or about that scene is that it resolves by Mr. Knightley, who had previously said he was not interested in dancing, taking pity on Harriet and saying, I'll dance with you. And so he take, he asks her to dance. The two of them have a lovely time out there. Um, Harriet dances beautifully. Mr. Knightley shows himself to, he can be graceful and a good dancer too. And in fact, at the very conclusion of the chapter, um, she thanks him for his kindness to Harriet. And he says, you know, honestly, you would have chosen, by choosing Harriet for Mr. Elton, um, that was a better choice than the, the petty and vain and cruel woman whom he's chosen to, as his wife instead. And that, you know, Harriet Smith, she seemed like a simple girl and she is a simple girl, but she's an honest and a good hearted girl. And that's that's something better that this other woman doesn't have. And so he, he sees a bit more of the character of Harriet Smith and he lets Emma know that it wasn't a cruel thing that she was doing. Um, when she had been mistaken about the character of Mr. Elton and tried to set him up with Harriet. The chapter ended though with the two of them deciding to dance together and an interesting line of her saying, you know, you've shown you can dance and you know that we are not really so much brother and sister as to make it at all improper. And he says, brother and sister? No, indeed. Now, I also think that's interesting too, because I wouldn't think there'd be anything improper about dancing brothers and sisters, if anything, I might read a little bit of historical stories. Uh, it seems to me like a brother or a sister is a perfect partner to dance with because there's nothing untoward or, you know, possibly romance there. So I don't know. Don't know if there's something being hinted out there. Um, so in chapter three of volume three, or the conclusion of what we read yesterday, chapter 39 of our book, there was an exciting thing that happened where, um, oh, by the way, Emma, meanwhile, had talked about how, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just saw Pam's comment. How dare they all think it's about them? Don't we know it's all about Emma? Yes, definitely it's all about Emma. What was I thinking? Um, <laughs> um, let's see. Um, meanwhile, in those early two chapters, Emma had reflected several times about the return of Frank Churchill. And she was both excited to see him because she likes him, but she was concerned, like, what if he is still too much in love with her? Because she has realized, even though she quite enjoys him as a person and as a friend, she's not romantically in love with him. And so um, she's concerned that there could be awkwardness there. But instead, when he comes back, she reassures herself that although he is still glad to see her and that they are, you know, tight, um, that he clearly, the, the feelings that he seemed to have for her before are no longer the same and that he is no longer in love with her. And there, or if he was, he no longer is manifesting those signs of it. And so she's able to take comfort from that. Okay. Let's see, finally, the conclusion of that chapter, the last chapter we read yesterday is that on her, on Harriet's way back in, back to visit um, Hartfield and Mr. Frank Churchill, by the way, is about to leave Highbury. Um, they are, there's an excitement that happens where Harriet is walking with a friend of hers from Mrs. Goddard's and there's some gypsies and the gypsy asks Harriet for, or I asked the two girls for a little bit of money and the two girls freak out and they run away. The one girl runs up the hill, but Harriet who's having a cramp in her, I'm guessing in her leg, um, because of the dancing the other night before she can't make it up the hill. And so she's like lying on the ground. Like I picture her crying and like, just take anything, take my money, take anything, just don't hurt me. And you know, the gypsy children now, they're all like, this is weird and pathetic. They surround her and they're trying to get money out of her and Mr. Frank Churchill rescues her. So he actually picks her up and carries her back to, carries her into Hartfield where she faints on the couch. It's quite a dramatic scene. And um, the gypsies end up leaving town. This is not a, a long-term problem, but it does lead to, you know, some interesting speculation about um, 
Mr. Frank Churchill having rescued Harriet, that um, Emma thinks that there might be something in that, that perhaps maybe Mr. Frank Churchill was charmed by Harriet in that moment. Perhaps that Mr. that, Ch that Harriet might be um, become enamored of Mr. Frank Churchill for rescuing her instead of thinking about, you know, still dwelling on Mr. Elton. And so, you know, Emma, Emma's back to matchmaking. She really can't help herself. It's who she is. Um, so today we just have two short chapters. Tomorrow, um, a couple long ones. But yeah, today, two short chapters. Um, so let's see. Hmm. Let's go in and enjoy our reading for today. We're going to read chapters four and five of volume three, or chapters 40 and 41 of Emma. A very few days had passed after this adventure when Harriet came one morning to Emma with a small parcel in her hand, and after sitting down and hesitating, thus began. Miss Woodhouse, if you were at leisure, I have something that I should like to tell you, a sort of confession to make, and then you, you know, it will be over. Emma was a good deal surprised, but begged her to speak. There was a seriousness in Harriet's manner which prepared her, quite as much as her words, for something more than ordinary. It is my duty, and I am sure it is my wish, she continued, to have no reserves with you on this subject, as I am happily quite an altered creature in one respect. It is very fit that you should have the satisfaction of knowing it. I do not want to say more than is necessary. I am too much ashamed of having, giving, of having given way as I have done, and I dare say you understand me. Yes, said Emma, I hope I do. How I could so long a time be fancying myself, cried Harriet warmly. It seems like madness. I can see nothing at all extraordinary in him now. I do not care whether I meet him or not except that of the two, I had rather not see him. And indeed, I would go any distance round to avoid him. But I do not envy his wife in the least. I neither admire her nor envy her as I have done. She is very charming, I dare say, and all that. But I think her very ill-tempered and disagreeable. I shall never forget her look the other night. However, I assure you, Miss Woodhouse, I wish her no evil. No, let them be ever so happy together. It will not give me another moment's pang. And to convince you that I have been speaking truth, I am now going to destroy what I ought to have destroyed long ago, what I ought never to have kept. I know that very well, blushing as she spoke. However, now I will destroy it all, and it is my particular wish to do it in your presence that you may see how rational I am grown. Cannot you guess what this parcel holds, said she with a conscious look. Not the least in the world. Did he ever give you anything? No, I cannot call them gifts, but there are things that I have valued very much. She held the parcel towards her and Emma read the words, most precious treasures on the top. Her curiosity was greatly excited. Harriet unfolded the parcel and she looked on with impatience. Within abundance of silver, silver paper was a pretty little Tunbridge ware box, which Harriet opened. It was well lined with the softest cotton, but excepting the cotton, Emma saw only a small piece of court plaster. Now, said Harriet, you must recollect. No, indeed I do not. Dear me. I should not have thought it possible you could forget what passed in this very room about court plaster, one of the very last times we ever met in it. It was but a very few days before I had more, my sore throat, just before Mr. and Mrs. John Knightley came. I think the very evening. Do not you remember his cutting his finger with your new penknife and your recommending court plaster? But as you had none about you and knew I had, you desired me to supply him. And so I took mine out and cut him a piece, but it was a great deal too large and he cut it smaller and kept playing some time with what was left before he gave it back to me. And so then, in my nonsense, I could not help making a treasure of it. So I put it by never to be used and looked at it now and then as a great treat. My dearest Harriet, cried Emma, putting her hand before her face and jumping up. 
You make me more ashamed of myself than I can bear. Remember it? Aye, I remember it all now. All except your saving this relic. I knew nothing of that till this moment, but the cutting the finger and my recommending court plaster and saying I had none about me. Oh, my sins, my sins. And I had plenty all the while in my pocket. One of my senseless tricks. I deserve to be under a continual blush all the rest of my life. Well, sitting down again. Go on, what else? And had you really some at hand yourself? I am sure I never suspected it. You did it so naturally. And so you actually put this piece of court plaster by for his sake, said Emma, recovering from her sense of shame and feeling divided between wonder and amusement. And secretly she added to herself, Lord bless me, when should I ever have thought of putting by in cotton a piece of court plaster that Frank Churchill had been pulling about? I never was equal to this. Here, resumed Harriet, turning to her box again, here is something still more valuable. I mean, that has been more valuable because this is what did really once belong to him, which the court plaster never did. Emma was quite eager to see the superior treasure. It was the end of an old pencil, the part without any lead. This was really his, said Harriet. Do not you remember one morning? No, I dare say you do not. But one morning, I forget exactly the day, but perhaps it was the Tuesday or Wednesday before that evening, he wanted to make a memorandum in his pocketbook. It was about spruce beer. Mr. Knightley had been telling him something about brewing spruce beer, and he wanted to put it down. But when he took out his, temp his pencil, there was so little lead that he soon cut it all away, and it would not do. So you lent him another, and this was left upon the table as good for nothing. But I kept my eye on it, and as soon as I dared, caught it up, and never parted with it again from that moment. I do remember it, cried Emma. I perfectly remember it, talking about spruce beer. Oh, yes, Mr. Knightley and I both saying we liked it, and Mr. Elton seeming resolved to learn to like it, too. I perfectly remember it. Stop. Mr. Knightley was standing just here, was he not? I have an idea he was standing just here. I do not know. I cannot recollect. It is very odd, but I cannot recollect. Mr. Elton was sitting here, I remember, much about where I am now. Well, go on. Oh, that's all. I have nothing more to show you or to say, except that I am now going to throw them both behind the fire, and I wish you to see me do it. My poor dear Harriet, and have you actually found happiness in treasuring up these things? Yes, simpleton as I was, but I am quite ashamed of it now and wish I could forget as easily as I can burn them. It was very wrong of me, you know, to keep any remembrances after he was married. I knew it was, but had not resolution enough to part with them. But Harriet, is it necessary to burn the court plaster? I have not a word to say for the bit of old pencil, but the court plaster might be useful. I shall be happier to burn it, replied Harriet. It has a disagreeable look to me. I must get rid of everything. There it goes. And there is an end, thank heaven, of Mr. Elton. And when, thought Emma, will there be a beginning of Mr. Churchill? She had soon afterwards reason to believe that the beginning was already made and could not but hope that the gypsy, though she had told no fortune, might be proved to have made Harriet's. About a fortnight after the alarm, they came to a sufficient explanation and quite undesignedly. Emma was not thinking of it at the moment, which made the information she received more valuable. She merely said, in the course of some trivial chat, Well, Harriet, whenever, whenever you marry, I should advise you to do so and so, and thought no more of it, till after a minute's silence, she heard Harriet say in a very serious tone, I shall never marry. Emma then looked up and immediately saw how it was, and after a moment's debate as to whether it, shall, as to whether it should pass unnoticed or not, replied, Never marry. That is a new resolution. It is one that I shall never change, however. 
After another short hesitation, I hope it does not proceed from... I hope it is not in compliment to Mr. Elton. Mr. Elton, indeed, cried Harriet indignantly. Oh, no. And Emma could just catch the words, so superior to Mr. Elton. She then took a longer time for consideration. Should she proceed no farther? Should she let it pass and seem to suspect nothing? Perhaps Harriet might think her cold and angry if she did, or perhaps if she were totally silent, it might only drive Harriet into asking her to hear too much. And against anything like such an unreserve as had been, such an open and frequent discussion of hopes and chances, she was perfectly resolved. She believed it would be wiser for her to say and know at once all that she meant to say and know. Plain dealing was always best. She had previously determined how far she should proceed on any application of the sort, and it would be safer for both to have the judicious law of her own brain laid down with speed. She was decided and thus spoke, Harriet, I will not affect to be in doubt of your meaning. Your resolution, or rather your expectation of never marrying, results from an idea that the person whom you might prefer would be too greatly your superior in situation to think of you. Is not it so? Oh, Miss Woodhouse, believe me, I have not the presumption to suppose. Indeed, I am not so mad. But it is a pleasure to me to admire him at a distance and to think of his infinite superiority to all the rest of the world with the gratitude, wonder, and veneration which are so proper in me especially. I am not at all surprised at you, Harriet. The service he rendered you was enough to warm your heart. Service, oh, it was such an inexpressible obligation. The very recollection of it and all that I felt at the time when I saw him coming, his noble look and my wretchedness before. Such a change, in one moment, such a change from perfect misery to perfect happiness. It is very natural. It is natural and it is honorable. Yes, honorable, I think, to choose so well and so gratefully. But that it will be a fortunate preference is more than I can promise. I do not advise you to give way to it, Harriet. I do not by any means engage for its being returned. Consider what you are about. Perhaps it will be wisest in you to check your feelings while you can. At any rate, do not let them carry you far unless you are persuaded of his liking you. Be observant of him. Let his behavior be the guide of your sensations. I give you this caution now because I shall never speak to you again on the subject. I am determined against all interference. Henceforward, I know nothing of the matter. Let no name ever pass our lips. We were very wrong before. We will be cautious now. He is your superior, no doubt, and there do seem objections and obstacles of a very serious nature. But yet, Harriet, more wonderful things have taken place. There have been matches of greater disparity. But take care of yourself. I would not have you too sanguine, though, however it may end, be assured that your raising your thoughts to him is a mark of good taste, which I shall always know how to value. Harriet kissed her hand in silent and submissive gratitude. Emma was very decided in thinking such an attachment no bad thing for her friend. Its tendency would be to raise and refine her mind, and it must be saving her from the danger of degradation. And now chapter five of volume three, or chapter 41 of Emma by Jane Austen. In this state of schemes and hopes and connivance, June opened upon Hartfield. To Highbury in general, it brought no material change. The Eltons were still talking of a visit from the Sucklings and of the use to be made of their barouche lando. And Jane Fairfax was still at her grandmother's, and as the return of the Campbells from Ireland was again delayed, and August instead of midsummer fixed for it, she was likely to remain there a full two months longer provided at least she were able to defeat Mrs. Elton's activity in her service and save herself from being hurried into a delightful situation against her will. Mr. Knightley, who, for some reason best known to himself, had certainly taken an early dislike to Frank Churchill, was only growing to dislike him more. He began to suspect him of some double dealing in his pursuit of Emma. That Emma was his object appeared indisputable, 
Everything declared it. His own attentions, his father's hints, his mother-in-law's guarded silence. It was all in unison. Words, conduct, discretion, and indiscretion told the same story. But while so many were devoting him to Emma, and Emma herself making him over to Harriet, Mr. Knightley began to suspect him of some inclination to trifle with Jane Fairfax. He could not understand it, but there were symptoms of intelligence between them. He thought so at least. Symptoms of admiration on his side, which having once observed, he could not persuade himself to think entirely void of meaning. However, he might wish to escape any of Emma's errors of imagination. She was not present when the suspicion first arose. He was dining with the Randalls family and Jane at the Eltons, and he he was dining with the Randalls' family and Jane at the Eltons, and he had seen a look, more than a single look, at Miss Fairfax, which, from the admirer of Miss Woodhouse, seemed somewhat out of place. When he was again in their company, he could not help remembering what he had seen, nor could he avoid observations which, unless it were like Cowper in his fire at twilight, myself creating what I saw, brought him yet stronger suspicion of there being a something of private liking, of private understanding even, between Frank Churchill and Jane. He had walked up one day after dinner, as he very often did, to spend his evening at Hartfield. Emma and Harriet were going to walk. He joined them, and on returning they fell in with a larger party, who, like themselves, judged it wisest to take their exercise early, as the weather threatened rain. Mr. and Mrs. Weston and their son, Miss Bates and her niece, who had accidentally met. They all united, and on reaching Hartfield Gates, Emma, who knew it was exactly the sort of visiting that would be welcome to her father, pressed them all to go in and drink tea with him. The Randalls party agreed to it immediately, and after a pretty long speech from Miss Bates, which few persons listened to, she also found it possible to accept dear Miss Woodhouse's most obliging invitation. As they were turning into the grounds, Mr. Perry passed by on horseback. The gentleman spoke of his horse. By the by, said Frank Churchill to Mrs. Weston presently, what became of Mr. Perry's plan of setting up his carriage? Mrs. Weston looked surprised and said, I did not know that he ever had any such plan. Nay, I had it from you. You wrote me word of it three months ago. Me? Impossible. Indeed you did. I remember it very perfect. I remember it perfectly. You mentioned it as what was certainly to be very soon. Mrs. Perry had told somebody and was extremely happy about it. It was owing to her persuasion, as she thought his being out, of, out in bad weather did him a great deal of harm. You must remember it now. Upon my word, I never heard of it till this moment. Never. Really, never. Bless me. How could it be? Then I must have dreamt it. But I was completely persuaded. Hmm. Uh, Miss Smith, you walk as if you were tired. You will not be sorry to find yourself at home. What is this? What is this? cried Mr. Weston. About Perry in a carriage. Is Perry going to set up his carriage, Frank? I am glad he can afford it. You had it from himself, had you? No, sir, replied his son, laughing. I seem to have had it from nobody. Very odd. I really was persuaded of Mrs. Weston's having mentioned it in one of her letters to Enscombe many weeks ago with all these particulars. But as she declares she never heard a syllable of it before, of course it must have been a dream. I am a great dreamer. I dream of everybody at Highbury when I am away, and when I have gone through my particular friends, then I begin dreaming of Mr. and Mrs. Perry. It is odd, though, observed his father, that you should have had such a regular connected dream about people whom it was not very likely you should be thinking of at Enscombe. Perry is setting up his carriage, and his wife's persuading him to it, out of care for his health, just what will happen, I have no doubt, some time or other, only a little premature. What an air of probability sometimes runs through a dream. And at others, what a heap of absurdities it is. Well, Frank, your dream certainly shows that Highbury is in your thoughts when you are absent. Emma, you are a great dreamer, I think. Emma was out of hearing. She had hurried on before her guests to prepare her father for their appearance and was beyond the reach of Mr. Weston's hint. Why, to own the truth, cried Miss Bates, who had been trying in vain to be heard the last two minutes, if I must speak on this subject, there is no denying that Mr. Frank Churchill might have, 
I do not mean to say that he did not dream it. I am sure I have sometimes the oddest dreams in the world. But if I am questioned about it, I must acknowledge that there was such an idea last spring, for Mrs. Perry herself mentioned it to my mother, and the Coles knew of it as well as ourselves. But it was quite a secret, known to nobody else, and only thought of about three days. Mrs. Perry was very anxious that he should have a carriage, and came to my mother in great spirits one morning, because she thought she had prevailed. Jane, don't you remember Grandmama's telling us of it when we got home? I forgot where we had been. I forget where we had been walking to. Very likely to Randall's. Yes, I think it was to Randall's. Mrs. Perry was always particularly fond of my mother. Indeed, I do not know who is not. And she had mentioned it to her in confidence. She had no objection to her telling us, of course, but it was not to go beyond. And from that day to this, I never mentioned it to a soul that I know of. At the same time, I will not positively answer from my never having dropped a hint, because I knew I do sometimes pop out a thing before I am aware. I am a talker, you know. I am rather a talker, and now and then I have let a thing escape me which I should not. I am not like Jane. I wish I were. I will answer for it. She never betrayed the least thing in the world. Where is she? Oh, just behind. Perfectly remember Mrs. Perry's coming. Extraordinary dream indeed. They were entering the hall. Mr. Knightley's eyes had preceded Miss Bates's in a glance at Jane. From Frank Churchill's face, where he thought he saw confusion suppressed or laughed away, he had involuntarily turned to hers, but she was indeed behind and too busy with her shawl. Mr. Weston had walked in. The two other gentlemen waited at the door to let her pass. Mr. Knightley suspected in Frank Churchill the determination of catching her eye. He seemed watching her intently. In vain, however, if it were so, Jane passed between them into the hall and looked at neither. There was no time for farther remark or explanation. The dream must be borne with, and Mr. Knightley must take his seat with the rest around the large modern circular table which Emma had introduced at Hartfield, and which none but Emma could have had power to place there and persuade her father to use, instead of the smaller-sized Pembroke, on which two of his daily meals had, for forty years, been crowded. Tea passed pleasantly, and nobody seemed in a hurry to move. Miss Woodhouse, said Frank Churchill, after examining a table behind him, which he could reach as he sat. Have your nephews taken away their alphabets, their box of letters? It used to stand here. Where is it? This is a sort of dull-looking evening that ought to be treated rather as winter than summer. We had great amusement with those letters one morning. I want to puzzle you again. Emma was pleased with the thought, and producing the box, the table was quickly scattered over with alphabets, which no one seemed so much disposed to employ as their two selves. They were rapidly forming words for each other, or for anybody else who would be puzzled. The quietness of the game made it particularly eligible for Mr. Woodhouse, who had often been distressed by the more animated sort, which Mr. Weston had occasionally introduced, and who now sat happily occupied in lamenting with tender melancholy over the departure of the dear of the poor little boys or in fondly pointing out as he took up any stray letter near him how beautifully emma had written it frank churchill placed a word before miss fairfax she gave a slight glance round the table and applied herself to it frank was next to emma jane opposite to them and mr knightley so placed as to see them all and it was his object to see as much as he could with as little apparent observation. The word was discovered and with a faint smile pushed away. If meant to be immediately mixed with the others and buried from sight, she should have looked on the table instead of looking just across, for it was not mixed. And Harriet, eager after every fresh word and finding out none, directly took it up and fell to work. She was sitting by Mr. Knightley and turned to him for help. The word was blunder. And as Harriet exultingly proclaimed it, there was a blush on Jane's cheek, which gave it a meaning not otherwise ostensible. Mr. Knightley connected it with the dream, but how it could all be was beyond his comprehension. How the delicacy, the discretion of his favorite could have been so lain asleep. He feared there must be some decided involvement. Disingenuousness and double dealing seemed to meet him at every turn. These letters were but the vehicle for gallantry and trick. It was a child's play, 
chosen to conceal a deeper game on Frank Churchill's part. With great indignation did he continue to observe him, with great alarm and distrust to observe also his two blinded companions. He saw a short word prepared for Emma and given to her with a look, sly and demure. He saw that Emma had soon made it out and found it highly entertaining, though it was something which she judged it proper to appear to censure, for she said, nonsense, for shame. He heard Frank Churchill next say with a glance towards Jane, I will give it to her, shall I? And as clearly heard Emma opposing it with eager laughing warmth, no, no, you must not. You shall not indeed. It was done, however. This gallant young man, who seemed to love without feeling and to recommend himself without complacence, directly handed over the word to Miss Fairfax, and with a particular degree of sedate civility, entreated her to study it. Mr. Knightley's excessive curiosity to know what this word might be made him seize every possible moment for darting his eye towards it, and it was not long before he saw it to be Dixon. Jane Fairfax's perception seemed to accompany his. Her comprehension was certainly more equal to the covert meaning, the superior intelligence of those five letters so arranged. She was evidently displeased, looked up, and seeing herself watched, blushed more deeply than he had ever perceived her, and saying only, I did not know that proper names were allowed, pushed away the letters with even an angry spirit, and looked resolved to be engaged by no other word that could be offered. Her face was averted from those who had made the attack and turned towards her aunt. I, very true, my dear, cried the latter, though Jane had not spoken a word. I was just going to say the same thing. It is time for us to be going indeed. The evening is closing in and grandmamma will be looking for us. My dear sir, you are too obliging. We really must wish you good night. Jane's alertness in moving proved her as ready as her aunt had preconceived. She was immediately up and wanting to quit the table, but so many were also moving that she could not get away. And Mr. Knightley thought he saw another collection of letters anxiously pushed toward her and resolutely swept away by her unexamined. She was afterwards looking for her shawl. Frank Churchill was looking also. It was growing dusk and the room was in confusion and how they parted, Mr. Knightley could not tell. He remained at Hartfield after all the rest, his thoughts full of what he had seen so full that when the candles came to assist his observations, he must, yes, he certainly must as a friend, an anxious friend, give Emma some hint, ask her some question. He could not see her in a situation of such danger without trying to preserve her. It was his duty. Pray, Emma, said he, may I ask in what lay the great amusement? The poignant sting of the last word given to you and Miss Fairfax. I saw the word and am curious to know how it could be so very entertaining to the one and so very distressing to the other. Emma was extremely confused. She could not endure to give him the true explanation, for though her suspicions were by no means removed, she was really ashamed of having ever imparted them. Oh, she cried in evident amusement, it all meant nothing, a mere joke among ourselves. The joke? he replied gravely, seemed confined to you and Mr. Churchill. He had hoped she would speak again, but she did not. She would rather busy herself about anything than speak. He sat a little while in doubt. A variety of evils crossed his mind. Interference, fruitless interference. Emma's confusion and the acknowledged intimacy seemed to declare her affection engaged. Yet he would speak. He owed it to her to risk anything that might be involved in an unwelcome interference rather than her welfare, to encounter anything rather than the remembrance of neglect in such a cause. My dear Emma, said he at last with earnest kindness, do you think you perfectly understand the degree of acquaintance between the gentleman and lady we have been speaking of? Between Mr. Frank Churchill and Miss Fairfax? Oh yes, perfectly. Why do you make a doubt of it? Have you never at any time had a reason to think that he admired her or that she admired him? Never, never, she cried with the most open eagerness. Never for the 20th part of a moment did such an idea occur to me. And how could it possibly come into your head? I have lately imagined that I saw symptoms of attachment between them. 
certain expressive looks which I did not believe meant to be public. Oh, you amuse me excessively. I am delighted to find that you can vouchsafe to let your imagination wander, but it will not do. Very sorry to check you in your first essay. But indeed, it will not do. There is no admiration between them, I do assure you, and the appearances which have caught you have arisen from some peculiar circumstances, feelings rather of a totally different nature. It is impossible exactly to explain. There is a good deal of nonsense in it, but the part which is capable of being communicated, which is sense, is that they are as far from any attachment or admiration for one another as any two beings in the world can be. That is, I presume it to be so on her side, and I can answer for its being so on his. I will answer for the gentleman's indifference. She spoke with a confidence which staggered, with a satisfaction which silenced Mr. Knightley. She was in gay spirits and would have prolonged the conversation, wanting to hear the particulars of his suspicions, every look described and all the wares and hows of a circumstance which highly entertained her. But his gaiety did not meet hers. He found he could not be useful and his feelings were too much irritated for talking. That he might not be irritated into an absolute fever by the fire which Mr. Woodhouse's tender habits required almost every evening throughout the year, he soon afterwards took a hasty leave and walked home to the coolness and solitude of Donwell Abbey. So, interesting, interesting chapter. Mr. Knightley is now suddenly playing matchmaker, even though he has um, derided that in Emma. He has suspicions, perhaps, about Mr. Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax. Mm -hmm. What say you, friends? What do you think? Um, and is Emma right about maybe Mr. Frank Churchill is in love with Harriet, or maybe he's just a one-sided affection of Harriet for Mr. Frank Churchill. Again, if you have thoughts on this, particularly if you're a first-time reader, that would be great to, to see. If, you are an ex if you've already read the story before or you remember the movies, you can comment on the writing, but try not to give away spoilers. We're getting so close to the end. I would hate to give away spoilers. So thank you very much for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow. I've been looking ahead. I think tomorrow is one of my Oh, cringy chapters. I think there's something coming. I know there's something coming soon that I, it's one of those chapters I don't enjoy because it's just, mm, and I think it might be tomorrow. So I'll peek ahead a little bit, but even the cringy chapters are important for the story. So we will see you tomorrow. I hope you're doing well and I will see you tomorrow for more of Emma. Bye friends.